So this video is a little bit of um, everything. And the common connection is irrational numbers, which we've spoken about a little bit at the beginning of the year when we classified numbers as rational and then went further and classified them as integers and whole, etc. Now we're going to look at the irrational part of it. And we're going to focus on expressions that have to do with pi, as well as solving equations that have cube roots and square roots. And the connection with cube roots and square roots to irrational numbers is that the majority of numbers that you take the square or cube root of will result in an irrational number. There are more numbers that if you take the square root of, you'll get irrational because they're not perfect squares than there are numbers that are perfect squares. So like nine is a perfect square because it results in three, but six, if you take the square root of that, is not a perfect square. It's going to result in some irrational number that's a decimal that will go on forever. So keep in mind that the connection between these topics of simplifying uh, expressions with pi and solving cube and square root equations is that we're often dealing with an answer that is irrational. So we've spoken a little about irrational numbers earlier in the year when we learned about classifying numbers. We mostly spoke about rational numbers at that time, and we classified rational numbers using their subcategories of integers and whole numbers and counting numbers. And then we just put aside those things that weren't rational as irrational. So a reminder is that irrational numbers are any non-repeating, non-terminating decimal. They're anything that can't be written as a fraction where the numerator and the denominator are both integers. Basically, they're numbers that never end, and they so they're a decimal that never ends, and they have no distinct pattern to them. So 0.3 repeating is a decimal that never ends. However, it has a pattern to it. It's a 3 that repeats. Whereas if you were to type the square root of 63 on your calculator or pi on your calculator, those decimals end only because the calculator has a distinct number of places. Those decimals will never, ever, ever, ever end. So pi and, the, and square roots that aren't perfect squares, like the square root of 63 and the square root of 21 and the square root of 45, those are irrational numbers. And we're going to go forward in this video and learn how to do equations and expressions with um, things that could potentially be irrational. So we're going to be looking at how to simplify expressions when you, are, you have pi in them. When you have pi as the symbol pi, um, we're going to use that symbol because we can never have a numerical representation for that that would be as accurate as identifying it as just pi. Any sort of um, number representation like 3.14 or 22 sevenths or whatever you would use would be an approximation because you are basically rounding or just giving an approximation. When you have pi's in an expression, you can treat them um, the same as you would treat a variable in that you would subtract or add the coefficients and then keep the variable the same. In this case, you're keeping the pi the same. So one pi is the same as just pi. So if you had two pi's and you subtracted one pi, you would be left with pi. For 14 pi minus 6 pi, you would follow order of operations. So you would do the top or the bottom first because that would be the parentheses step. So 16 pi, 14 pi minus 6 pi would give me 8 pi. 8 pi divided by 2 would be the same as 4 pi because I would divide the 8 divided by 2 and get 4, and then I would just keep the pi there. Pi times pi, the same as pi squared. Just like 4 times 4 is the same as 4 squared, or 27 times 27 is the same as 27 squared. 7 pi plus 8 pi is 15 pi. I add it to 7 and 8, and then I just let the pi come along for the ride. So if I multiply 7 by approximately 3 and 8 by approximately 3, I would get the same as 15 times approximately 3. If you don't believe me, get out your calculator and try it. We have looked at solving equations where there is an exponent of 2 or squared equations where you take the square root. We have not looked at when there's an exponent of 3, which is a cube root. And I'm just going to review this with you because in some cases it's going to give you a square root that is not a perfect square and therefore it would be an irrational number. So just like any equation, my goal is to isolate my variable. And so in this case, my goal is to first get the x squared by itself and then my final step will be to take the square root. 
So would you get the x squared by itself, or to isolate the x squared, I'm going to divide both sides by 3. So in doing so, I get x squared, and that's equal to 9. When I solve x squared is equal to 9, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Here is an important part to understand. Every time that we have used a square root equation or taking the square root as our final step so far this year in math, we have been talking about a length. And therefore, we have only identified the square root as a positive number. However, a negative number times itself will always give you a positive one. So when you're taking the square root of a number, you have to make sure to say that not only is 3 in this case an answer, but negative 3 is also an answer because negative 3 times negative 3 is 9. The only time that negative 3 would not be an answer for our purposes in 7th grade math is when you're talking about a length, because a length can't be a negative number. You can also uh, sim uh, shortcut this answer to be the plus or minus symbol, which means the positive and the negative of three. So either of these answers will be correct, but if you do not have both three and negative three, your answer won't be complete. So if I go on to the second equation, now I have a minus 10, so I'm gonna have to add 10. So I do the same steps as I would if it wasn't an x squared equation and it was just a regular equation. So I would add 10 to both sides, making a zero pair, and I would get 40 equals 4x squared. Again, I'm going to divide both sides by 4 because my goal is to isolate the x squared first before I take the square root. And then here, I'm going to take the square root of both sides and get x equals the square root of 10. So the square root of 10 gives me an approximation of 3.16. So it's the positive or negative of 3.16. When I go to the cube root equation, you're going to have to identify on your calculator, because each calculator is different, where your cube root button is. Basically, a cube root asks your, you what number times itself three times would give you 27. So square root asks you what number times itself gives you 9 or 27, but a cube root is what number times itself times itself. So a number times the same number times the same number, which gives you 27. So the inverse operation is called a cube root, which means that you have a 3 on the outside of that, what we call radical. This is a radical um, and a cube root would have a 3 on the outside of it. So in this case, x equals 3, and it's just 3. It can't be negative because if you multiply a negative times a negative times a negative, you will get a negative. So whereas you can't take the square root of a negative number, you can take the cube root of a negative number. So the cube root of negative 27 would be negative 3. For the last equation, I'm first going to subtract 12 from both sides. Again, my goal is to isolate x cubed. I make a zero pair. I'm left with 2x cubed equals 12. I want to isolate x cubed, so I'm going to divide by the coefficient, which is 2. I'm going to get x cubed equals 6. And now I'm going to take the cube root, which is the button you need to find on your calculator. And I get approximately that x equals 1.82.